Good afternoon. It looks like everyone's getting silent, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. My name is Kenneth Young. I'm chair of the Department of Geography and Environment. For those folks who are visiting us, welcome. Uh, we're on our 60th year of existing as a department, and one of the things we've been doing to celebrate those 60 years is asking a number of our um, our faculty to present on their research. So today, uh, Dr. Francisco Perez will be presenting on his, and I think you'll get a real good sense of the kind of research he's been doing and its importance and how it fits into broader themes. Um, Francisco comes to us from a very interesting background. I'll just uh, summarize it real quickly here because it's, it is pretty fascinating how, how he came to be who he is. Um, bachelor's in architecture from Caracas, Venezuela, and doing a lot of really practical things in terms of environmental impact assessments and environmental planning. Um, getting a master's in landscape architecture then from Berkeley and continuing on to get his PhD. His PhD from Berkeley is in plant ecology and geomorphology from 1985. 1986, he didn't mess around. He came right to the University of Texas and started working as a professor and rose from assistant to associate to full professor here in the department. Um, extremely well-traveled. I would say he's one of the world's experts on high mountain areas of the world. Um, and I think you'll get a sense of that today in today's talk. Uh, he's got about 70 journal articles on plants, soils, geomorphology, and even more intriguingly, plant-soil interrelationships. To give you a sense of some of that research and the research outlets, he has published recently in um, journals like Catina, Geography Compass, Geomorphology, Flora, Plant Ecology, and Geoderma. And I think that gives you sort of a sense of how he tries to both look at geomorphology, soils, and then plants, but also how they fit together. I think if you haven't paid much attention to sort of the details of how the natural world works in terms of individual plants and the soils and substrate and slopes that surround them, I think you'll get some insights into looking at how Francis was able to pull those systems apart and look at them in, in great detail and then explain how they actually function. So without further ado, I'll let Francisco introduce his talk. He, he promises that the second slide has the title of his talk, so I won't be Very generous. Oh yeah, there must be a title somewhere in there. I'm going to be talking about, oh, there you go, these titles go fast, <laughs> the biogeomorphic and ecological influence of stones on Haleakala silver soils. And as you can see by that very attractive uh, perspective, um, my research takes place in Hawaii, although of course somewhere in the back is Maui, not the big islands. Um, in the process of presenting all of this information, I really want to touch upon a significant aspect of my research that most people may not be aware of. I'm going to be talking a lot about volcanic environments and volcanic sedimentology and plastic deposits. Now, I wanted to follow the lead of professors Doolittle and also Ken. And in a way, uh, this is not only 60 years of the department. I'm going to be 60 sometime this year. So this seemed like a good time to have a retrospective of the last 35 years since I started doing field work. And in the process, of course, I have been, geez, I have been aging. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see. <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, nice to be able to be here with you and say those things. <coughs> oh, this thing is going too fast. Um, you know that I was born and my earlier years were in southern Spain. The landscape of southern Spain is a fairly interesting one. At least it was to me, um, you have in the front area um, these vineyards. And as you can see, they're covered with uh, stones. In the background, what we have is small mountains. They crisscross the peninsula all over. And they're more or less kept in a natural uh, sort of environment. Um, this one, for example, is covered by Aleppo pine which is a very common plant in Southern Europe. Now, what you have over here is a situation in which I became fascinated with the stones. I'm not exactly sure why, but believe it or not, um, part of my talk is trying to delve into the question of how significant is our beginning, our early years. When I was 11 years old, I remember it very well, I was up on Monte, a mountain similar to this one, and I started pushing rocks downhill. I thought it was fun. 
until 20 minutes later, a Guardia Civil came and said that if I didn't stop that, I would go to jail. <laughs> and I was really scared. Truly, you know, in the 1960s, nothing happened in Spain without Generalismo Francisco Franco learning about it. <laughs> so, this is the environment that I was um, growing in. You see the slopes, some of the rocks, but I promise I didn't throw those down. <laughs> and of course, the smaller rocks in the foreground. Later, I, um, I of course became aware of bigger rocks throughout the world. And it wasn't until I went to the Venezuelan Andes and I started climbing those slopes that I became aware of the fact that there were even bigger mountains with greater accumulations of rocks. In the California Cascades, in the 70s and 80s, I also became aware of the fact that those volcanoes were able to produce enormous accumulations of blocks. And let me tell you something, if you have never climbed a table slope, don't try it, because it's going to tax all your resources. However, Northern California was a real learning experience for me. Um, they have all kinds of large blocks, small blocks, um, tabular blocks, smaller stone streams like this one, and I became then involved in research in that particular area as well. Actually, in 1986, finally, I got to do an experiment in which I threw downhill 250 rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and lucky for me, this time, no Guardia Civil came to bother me. <laughs> they were too far from me. Well, eventually my family, my two kids here, they became involved with my field trips. They came and they were very, uh, very nice uh, helpers. Although, <laughs> they were not sometimes as fascinated with rocks as I was. But we trekked all kinds of volcanic areas throughout the West and then eventually in other places of the world. Now, my involvement with volcanoes, in a way, was accidental but it allowed me to actually realize that there were places in the world where all you had is a complete, continuous 100% cover of stones. These are the recent uh, Kilauea flows that were produced probably a couple of years before we visited them in 2007. Well, for someone who's interested in rocks, this is a great place. Now, I know very well that it was when I was nine years old and my family took me to a trip to the Andes. I have no idea why I became interested in these types of plants, but ever since I was a kid, I decided that that was a really interesting type of vegetation. So I did some research in the giant rosettes of the Andes first, and eventually became also interested in giant rosettes in other tropical environments. Uh, this is, of course, the silver sort, which is going to be the main focus of today's uh, talk. More recently then, I was able to go to other tropical, subtropical environments where, again, as you can see, the Yayan uh, rosettes are very important. The only place where that I haven't visited for Yayan rosettes is really uh, East Africa, but who knows? Before I continue, I would like to thank all the people who have helped me, primarily helping me with, uh, well, carrying my backpack so to speak. <laughs> and uh, I need to start with my oldest son, Andres. Well, Andres right now is a system analyst working for Google. He's very happy there with other geeks like him. <laughs> and I'm happy too. And I also have to thank my youngest son, Alex. Uh, he's actually right now a PhD candidate in nuclear engineering at the University of Michigan. He should have the degree in three weeks. And then I would like to thank also my wife, Martha. She is a good sport. Uh, she always poses in the middle of those vegetation types, even if sometimes they're kind of prickly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, especially early in my career, two of my brothers, Ernesto and Javier, both of them actually studied natural sciences and they came with me many field trips both in North and South America. 